the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action is the global interagency network that promotes the protection and well-being of children in humanitarian settings. This video is part of a series exploring the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action, or CPMS. This set of 10 principles, 28 standards, and accompanying guidance is key for all humanitarians as we work to fulfill our duties toward children. In this video, we look at Pillar 3, the standards to develop adequate strategies and the social-ecological approach that informs it. Around the world, children grow up in families, communities, and societies. Each of these has an impact on their protection and well-being, especially in humanitarian contexts. Protection risks that affect children, that is violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, affect girls and boys at an individual level. But it's important to also understand that these risks are also determined by various factors within the families or the family situations where these children live, in communities and in the societies where the children reside. By placing the child at the center of all humanitarian efforts and understanding the interconnections between a child, their family, community, and society, we can develop a more holistic prevention and response approach to child protection. The social ecological approach to programming provides a framework of action to help us achieve better outcomes for children. It lies at the heart of the CPMS Pillar 3, which describes key approaches and interventions for preventing and responding to protection risks that children face in humanitarian settings. So the ecological model almost forces us to, to expand our, our lens and, and look at the broader and the more holistic development of a child from the perspective of all of those that contribute to the development of a child. Rather than looking at a single protection issue, this model adopts a systems approach and considers the full range of risks and protective factors affecting children. By doing this, we can better understand the root causes of the risks and work with other sectors to develop solutions. Let's take a closer look at how the social ecological approach can help to strengthen our efforts to prevent and respond to harm to children. With the child at the heart of the approach, it is important to consider how we can best address their immediate needs as well as build their resilience. I think a good starting point would be to take an, a participatory approach in applying the model. That means that we need to reach out to children, we need to reach out to families, we need to reach out to communities to understand their needs, to understand their perspectives, to understand their capacities, and also to understand their wishes. Case management forms an important part of this process. Once we understand the needs of a child from their perspective, we can develop tailored solutions that meet these needs. These can include psychosocial support, linking children to the services they need, family support, and group activities. Group activities for child well-being, which can be found in Standard 15 of the CPMS, provide a chance for children to come together in a safe, predictable environment to learn, express themselves, make connections, and feel supported. Case management may include working with children in contact with the law and their families. The wide range of justice issues for children that may occur in a humanitarian setting is covered in Standard 20. When children feel safe and protected within a family environment, they are more resilient. Parents and caregivers play a critical role in helping children to cope during humanitarian crises. When you're supporting a family, um, you naturally are supporting a much bigger spectrum of issues than just, for example, the fact that the child is engaged in child labor. If a parent or parents of a child feel supported through interactions with uh, or, or engagement with social protection programs, they're not just going to be better on not putting their child into labor, they're just going to be able to be better parents for, for their children. In a humanitarian setting, 
parents and caregivers may be overwhelmed themselves. Standard 16 in the CPMS outlines the different ways in which we can strengthen family and caregiving environments for children. Depending on the situation, caregivers may need different levels of support. Services can include psychosocial support, cash assistance, or connecting with other families. In Northeast Nigeria, parents were offered positive parenting lessons as part of mental health and psychosocial support services. These parenting lessons are important not only for parents to understand the needs of their children, but also to understand how parents themselves play a very important role in the social, mental and physical well-being of their children. As child protection actors, we should work to keep families together as much as possible and exhaust all other options before considering alternative care, which is outlined in Standard 19. Humanitarian crises can disrupt the community networks that exist to protect children. However, humanitarian actors and partners can equally work with communities to rebuild and strengthen these protective networks as quickly as possible. In Iraq, many years of conflict have forced families to flee their homes and the COVID-19 pandemic made things even worse. Using the social ecological approach, child protection workers in the country developed a different strategy to address violence against children. So we asked ourselves, who is responsible for violence against children during those times? And if so, who uh, do children trust and would seek their support? And to answer that, we found out that children are exposed mostly to violence uh, against them from their parents or their caregivers. And uh, they would seek help from their relatives and the extended family at first. So when we targeted parents with parenting skills and psychosocial support because they were going through tough times at this time and the extended families and relatives and also community members were trained on uh, safe identification and referral and awareness raising of violence against children and how to prevent it. So by looking at the child within the socio-ecological framework, you naturally are more likely to program preventatively than just very, very kind of response to that particular need of the child. And it also opens up opportunities for working across sectors. If you're looking at a family as a unit or a community as a unit, if um, you, you're not satisfying the basic needs of that family and, and community, you're unlikely to be able to get them to support the child. At the society level, we have an opportunity in the broader justice, education and child protection systems to support the well-being and protection of children. This includes strengthening the capacity of existing actors to fulfill their duties in humanitarian settings, promoting and drafting laws and policies to support all children's rights, advocating for adequate, stable funding to protect children, addressing harmful social norms and values, and building back better with stronger social welfare systems and safety nets. But to achieve all of this, we must work across sectors and ministries. By using the social ecological approach highlighted in the standards of CPMS Pillar 3, we can strengthen the systems to more effectively prevent and respond to children's protection and well-being needs. What I find most exciting about using this approach is that it gives everybody a chance to be involved in child protection work. Whether you're a boy or a girl, whether you're a mother or a father or a caregiver, if you're a community leader or even a lawmaker, the approach allows you to be part of the prevention and response to violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation against children. If you would like to learn more about the socio-ecological model or approach, we really, really encourage you to have a look at the child protection minimum standards that were relaunched in 2019 that are available online.